Today on Government Matters, more buying power for the Pentagon, the Defense Department and General Services Administration teaming up. GSA leader Emily Murphy will tell you how it works. When does the Pentagon bring more people back to the building? Chief Management Officer Lisa Hirschman lays out the strategy. And will the Navy's new fleet structure assessment get stuck in the shipyard? Congressman Rob Whitman on what the sea services are up against. Government Matters starts right now. From Washington, D.C. and around the world, this is Government Matters with Francis Rose. Thanks for watching the weekend edition of Government Matters, the only show covering the latest news, trends, and topics that matter to the business of government. I'm your host, Francis Rose. The General Services Administration and Defense Department are partners in driving category management across government. The Government Accountability Office finds most agencies can do more to use contracts that already exist to avoid buying IT products and services twice. Emily Murphy is the Administrator of GSA. Lisa Hirschman is the Chief Management Officer at the Department of Defense. Emily and Lisa, welcome back to the program. Thanks for coming on. Emily, I want to start with you. What's kind of the state of the art in category management right now? Thanks, Francis. As you know, Lisa and I are the co-leads for category management government-wide. GSA is hosting the, uh, the PMO for category management, which means that DOD is really our critical partner in helping us focus on opportunities for joint success and government-wide success. It means we've been designing best-in-class contracts that meet DOD's demanding security requirements, such as including CMMC, supply chain requirements, uh, we've been successful with contracts such as Oasis, Alliant, EIS, Comps.com, and we're currently working on contracts such as STARS-3, DOS, 2JIT, and Polaris. The goal is ultimately for GSA to focus on common requirements so that DOD can prioritize their unique mission-critical requirements. Lisa, for a long time, the Defense Department and the General Services Administration have had a relationship. There was a time where it was kind of an arm's length relationship. There have been times where the collaboration has been very tight. What has driven this relationship that we're talking about today beyond the administration saying, you guys are, we're putting your names on this? Common outcomes. We're both focused on outcomes rather than outputs and generally creating value, not only for how we spend our money, but also becoming easier to do business with. You know, at DOD, from a contracting standpoint, we have close to 45,000 contracting officers and 2,500 contracting offices. And so to be able to um, co collaborate and find the best vehicles, the best pricing, and all the other terms and conditions, and to be able to not only do that across DOD, but partner with folks like Emily at GSA and take it government-wide is a huge advantage for everyone. Given the 73-year history that the Defense Department has, Lisa, of each of the branches in the fourth estate kind of wanting to do their own thing, what's the cultural um, issue been, if any, in trying to drive this just throughout your department, let alone across the entire government? So at first, uh, I think people were quite skeptical. We talked a lot about how this worked in the private sector, but that didn't necessarily translate with being able to work at DOD. So what we did is we took a little bit of a different approach. And rather than sit in a classroom and go through training and teach folks new techniques, we actually integrated experiential training. So we have our folks participating in 90-day sprints where they bring actual contracts that they're working on. They sit with our uh, vendors to help them understand the techniques, help them and show them how to use data bring industry benchmarks into the equation and show them how it works sitting side by side it's less training and more knowledge transfer and that has been huge and that that's made a big difference in the buy-in now we've tipped the scales where rather than saying we really want you to come do this people are knocking on their door and saying we've got to do this and to that end emily what is in your view for this to be successful long term the mix of carrot and stick. I imagine the carrot is here is the business benefit to your organization by using these techniques, by using this. And the stick is you just got to do it this way because we want to reach these outcomes. What does the right mix look like for success in your view, Emily? 
Well, so candidly, Francis, when I first started at GSA, I was a little skeptical about category management. I was worried it was just a nice way of saying contract bundling. But when I've seen how the administration has implemented it and got the true opportunities we've gotten from category management, it really is that carrot and stick. We've saved $40 billion. We've increased our small business utilization in all 10 categories. We've strengthened our supply chain and our industrial base. We've reduced duplicative contracts by 50,000 contracts, which reduces administrative costs and makes it easier for vendors to do business with us. And it's letting us buy smarter. I mean, when we look at the next step of this, it's allowed FAS to save a billion dollars or to spend a billion dollars of small business of its own money for the first time ever. So they're getting rewarded for meeting their small business goals. Uh, category management gets a lot of the credit for us, us having all of the success. One of the things uh, that we're hearing a lot about in acquisition over the last month or two, especially uh, from Mike Wooten at the Office of Federal Procurement Policy, Emily, is frictionless acquisition. What's the intersection between your category management work and what Mike is talking about, about frictionless acquisition? So right now, GSA is working with NASA, DOD, and OMB to set up an IT vendor management office this year. And that's going to help the federal government improve how it buys IT products and services by sharing our information expertise. Ultimately, the result's gonna be faster and smarter IT buying. But to be successful, we're gonna need the help of our industry partners. On October 14th, we're gonna be hosting Virtual Industry Day. If anyone wants to participate, please email category.management at gsa.gov. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, one of the issues that people are really concerned about in addition to all of the acquisition uh, progress that you're trying to make is going back to the office and when they're going to do that. When we come back, the plan for reopening the Pentagon and the future of work after the virus. My conversation with Emily Murphy and Lisa Hirschman continuing in just a moment. You're watching ABC 7. Welcome back. Up to 80% of employees who work in the Pentagon are able to return to the building now if they choose. The future of work for the Defense Department and other agencies is changing quickly in response to the pandemic. I'm back with Emily Murphy, the Administrator of GSA, and Lisa Hirschman, the Chief Management Officer of the Department of Defense. Lisa, thanks for coming on. Um, last time you were, we, we talked, you were describing kind of the comeback plan and the, the phases that you're undertaking there. Where are you right now in bringing people back to the office? Well, we are now allowing up to 80% return. And let me be clear, we never shut down. We, our mission continued. It was just our locations changed. And we're currently at about 60%. At one point, we got as low as about 17% in the building. And that was in the March, April timeframe which believe it or not, that meant about 5,300 people at the Pentagon, which felt like a ghost town. So we're at 60% in the Pentagon and about 30% in our lease spaces currently. Biggest mitigating factor right now is childcare and transportation. And we're watching closely Maryland, Virginia, uh, Washington DC, the national capital region to watch their ebbs and flows of cases. And uh, that's a, that's a contributing factor as well. What can the Pentagon do, if anything, about mitigating both of those challenges? Or are you pretty much at, at the uh, having to deal with whatever the local infrastructures decide? The local infrastructure is a big factor. However, we are also finding that it doesn't have to be an all or nothing proposition. It doesn't have to be either full-time in the building or full-time work from home. So we are encouraging people to adopt a hybrid approach so they may spend some time or maybe a few days in the building and a few days out of the building. We're continuously looking at social distancing. We're relooking at all of our workspace configurations. Our conference rooms are all have socially distanced, uh, have taken that into consideration. Lots of cleaning. We do screening at, at the entry and our contact tracing has been very helpful with trying to uh, help mitigate uh, when there is an issue and, and help people understand and identify who needs to self-quarantine. Emily, last time you were on the program, we talked about the cleaning and some of the kind of logistics and tactical stuff uh, that GSA as the landlord and property manager for the government is undertaking. I'm interested more though in kind of the philosophical or existential view 
of real estate and workspaces in the federal government moving forward. What's your thought when you hear somebody like Lisa talking about a hybrid work environment and pretty much every civilian agency saying the same thing, what does that mean maybe five years from now about what an organization like PBS is doing and thinking and working toward with landlords and with the space the government owns? So Francis, we'd, we'd actually started a GSA initiative called Workplace 2030. Um, we're sort of rebranding it as Workplace 2021 at this point uh, because we don't have 10 years to get there. We might have a goal for 10 years from now, but right now what we're trying to do is work with our tenant agencies understand that there is no one size fits all, but as they look at their space, how much hybrid work do they want to do? What kind of work do they want to do in facilities? Do they need skiffs? Do they need laboratories? Do they need auditoriums? Or do they just need offices? If they're going to be working from home, what kind of equipment do we want to send home with them so that they can be you know, safely teleworking? And I don't mean that just for a physical distance, but I mean from an IT cybersecurity safety standpoint. Uh, how do we make sure that the, the, in a hybrid work environment also that the people in the office aren't the ones who are getting the prioritization in a conversation, that those who are virtually participating are just as vital and are getting the same opportunities. So we're doing a lot of work to try and come up with possible solutions for each of our customer agencies. A general Services Administration, I think, Emily, in the the late 2000 zeros, whatever aughts, I guess, or whatever we're calling them in the early 2010s, was I think now ahead of the curve when they had these telework centers that were located. I think there were six or eight of them around the Beltway uh, that people could go and work to before bandwidth was readily available in people's home locations. That we're now seeing private sector companies that are concentrated in one geographical location considering the same kind of thing. Is that a possibility for this uh, works, Workplace 2030 or 2021, where folks maybe from different agencies will work in one location and say in Springfield or in Gaithersburg or in Landover or something like that, rather than having everybody coming back to DC at some point? Absolutely, and it's actually in 2019, the Public Building Service went out with a request for proposals for just that kind of space solution so that we could have multiple federal agencies coming in and working in a, in a shared space. Now, it again poses IT challenges, poses other security challenges that we have to address. But as we're looking at our own footprint, we're wondering, you know, for example, could part of GSA's headquarters building be one of those you know, touchdown spaces, those landing spaces for people when they want or need to come into a federal space? Touchdown. there's a lot of Touchdown is a great name for that, as given that we're going into week five of the NFL season, I believe it is. Um, Lisa, what does this look like in an environment like the Pentagon, where there is so much information that's shared that can't necessarily be shared outside the building, at least the way the techno technological infrastructure looks today? Uh, what Emily said is exactly right. You know, this uh, pandemic gave us a chance to really stress test our systems, whether it was business systems or our equipment. And we found that from an IT perspective and equipment on the cl for classified work, we were not prepared for the high number of people that were now teleworking. And so I give great kudos to our CIO and the team to ramp up very quickly to be able to do that. But again, that's where the hybrid approach, if you need to be in and, and be in a skiff, you can come in for part of the time and then maybe telework from a, a different location for the other part of the time. So whether it's quit, equipment, systems, and location, we're looking at that broad spectrum and more of a workplace ecosystem as an approach rather than uh, just one physical location. Lisa Hirschman, Emily Murphy, we're out of time. Great to talk to both of you today. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks so much, Francis. Up next, the plan to build a bigger, more lethal Navy may get stuck in the shipyard. Straight ahead on Government Matters, Congressman Rob Whitman on the holdup to the Pentagon's 500 ship fleet. You're watching ABC7. The future Navy force study recommends the fleet should grow to as many as 530 ships in the coming years. That means almost twice as many new ships as the Navy has now. The biggest problem, though, may be getting all those ships built and in the water in the first place. 
Congressman Rob Whitman, Republican from Virginia, represents the first district of that state. Congressman, welcome. Thanks for coming on today. You're writing in Defense News this week, yeah. America is simply no longer positioned to be the arsenal of democracy. That sounds very serious, sir. Why do you think that's the case? Well, the challenges we have ahead are with not only the number of ships we need to build, but also how we're going to maintain those ships. And we see what's happening with China, with them surpassing us for the total number of ships. But most importantly is the capacity that they have, the industrial capacity to not only build ships, but to quickly repair them. The challenge for us is in any large scale conflict is making sure that we can accommodate whatever damage or attrition we have to our ships. Uh, that is going to be severely tested. In fact, I would argue we're not going to be able to make that up if we do find ourselves having ships that are damaged and having to get them back to the yards to be repaired. Our ship repair capacity in the United States is old. It doesn't have the capacity necessary. We even see today that much of the work that is scheduled to be done is behind. Only 75% of the work scheduled to be done on ships gets done on time. Our shipyards, all four of them, public shipyards, are all over 100 years old. The one in Norfolk, Virginia, is over 250 years old. It, the, the, the complexity of what needs to be done with ships today doesn't match where we have the age of our shipyards and also the dry docks, the places where we bring these ships in uh, to, to, have sh to have work done on the hull uh, are also antiquated. They need to be up to date. The, the, there are only two, two uh, dry docks today that can actually work on the Nimitz-class carriers, and none can work on the new Ford-class carriers. That's where we are. What should we do uh, location-wise as well? The shipyards that I'm thinking of are in Maine, uh, in your uh, district, in mm -hmm. uh, Alabama, and the fourth one escapes me at the moment. What do we have on the West Coast that would give us geographic proximity for something happening, say, in the South China Sea? Well, we have a shipyard in Puget Sound, a public shipyard there. The question is, should we have capacity closer to the place where our ships are actually on duty? So if they were to have some damage, instead of having to steam all the way back to the United States, shouldn't we have a shipyard closer to those areas in the Pacific? Uh, we do have a yard that can do some work, limited work, uh, in Pearl Harbor. Uh, we used to have a dry dock in Guam. Uh, we do not have that capacity anymore. So the question is, is, you know, if we do find ourselves in an extended conflict, is it smart to maybe have some capacity closer to where uh, our ships might suffer damage? Listen, we have some, some great relationships. We have some repair capacity in Yokosuka, which is a, a base, a naval base there in Japan. But we aren't able to repair our large ships our nuclear aircraft carriers or our nuclear submarines. That's very, very specialized work. Those have to come all the way back to the United States. And the question is, should we have some of that capacity closer to where we need it, especially with this repositioning of forces to the Indo-Pacific? And that's where the Chinese are challenging us. That's where our naval presence needs to be. I think it's time to ask that question. Shouldn't we have capacity there uh, as well as on the West Coast, down the East Coast and Gulf Coast? Who should own that capacity, Congressman? Do you want to see the Navy or the federal government more broadly own that capacity and operate it? Or would you like to see someone, whether it's the government broadly, the Defense Department or the Navy specifically, incent the private sector to build those yards? I think the fastest way to get that capacity is to incent the private sectors to have a joint agreement with the Department of Defense to go through the process of capitalization, that is to get the money, to go through the planning, to go through the construction would just take too long. There are lots of opportunities out there, I believe, to expand existing capacity to make sure we have that available to maintain U.S. ships, especially when it comes to uh, the critical nature of nuclear powered ships. I understand all the security with that, and we absolutely need to keep that in the forefront of our minds, but I do think that there are opportunities there for us to to expand that capacity. We already see now we're going to some of our build yards like uh, Huntington Ingalls Industry to do work on our attack submarines, our nuclear powered attack submarines because we just don't have the capacity in our public yards. So yes, we absolutely need to look at those partnerships 
because we can't capitalize quickly enough public yards to do that. You mentioned some of the places that we have capacity or have had capacity in the past, Congressman. Is there a place here, is there an appropriate place for our allies to help us, at least in the interim time between now and when we get to the owned capacity or the contracted capacity that we need? Well, I do. I think we have uh, close allies in the Indo-Pacific, like Japan, where we could look at uh, some efforts there. Remember, uh, it's, it's the specifics of maintaining a nuclear-powered ship. Uh, those are very, very specific skill sets that go there, plus the protection we have to provide, not only to the shipyard workers, but also because of the classified nature of what goes on in those ships is incredibly important. But we can do that. We, we have some of those facilities here, like at uh, Portsmouth and, and in, in Norfolk uh, and in Puget Sound. But I think that we can have those agreements with other governments to make sure we put the proper protections in place to protect the critical nature of that work and the systems on board those ships, but to make sure that we can do that work to meet the needs. And it, and it may be that you just say, hey, we, we, we can't maybe do it with a foreign partner overseas, but we can indeed enhance the capacity in the private sector of shipyards that already do work on nuclear ships in the build process. They should be, imp they should be included on the maintenance process. Congressman Whitman, a lot more I'd love to cover, but we're out of time, yes. so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you so much. Don't forget, if you missed an episode of Government Matters, you can find it on our website, govmatters.tv, and you get a preview of every program by signing up for a daily program guide. You just text GOVMATTERS to the number 22828. I'm back in two minutes. That's the latest from Washington. Join me weeknights at 8 and 11 on WJLA 24-7 News and next Sunday morning at 1030 on ABC7. Stay plugged in on issues that matter to the business of government. Thanks for watching. I'm Francis Rose.